There is a unmet need in post-operative monitoring of patients to detect early incidences of respiratory depression so meaningful interventions can be made prior to patient decompensation. There's a variety of technologies that are being explored looking at the best way to do that. The advantage of the bed steam technography is that you have real-time information on the patient's respiratory effort in case of patients on supplemental oxygen or other situations, you know when the patient's making respiratory effort. And this sort of information could be useful for those caring for patients on the ward to intervene quickly. So while we've relied on, on the pulse oximeter for about two or three decades now, um, there's more and more evidence that, that suggests that we are missing ventilatory events. Ventilatory events are not very obvious and, and just, just a clinical exam. Uh, in, 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 in an interesting, you know, we, there's been interesting literature in the past that's actually looked at this, that a, an examination of a patient just trying to count respiratory ra rate uh, at the bedside is often fallacious and people tend to put in the same number all the time. So a, the one reason why we need ventilatory monitoring is that we need true data. The other reason why we need ventilatory monitoring is that our patients are often subject to uh, supplemental oxygen for good or bad reason on the, on the general care floor. And while that increases the number on the pulse oximeter, that also masks hypoventilation. So a patient might be taking shallow breaths, might be retaining CO2, but then you're providing him, him or her supplemental oxygen, so your numbers only on a pulse oximeter look great. While on the other hand, your patient's going into CO2 narcosis or just doing shallow breathing and some stage is going to decompensate. So capnography and oximetry pretty much go hand in hand and uh, the, the, there is no reason to separate them out and use them separately at all. It's also been shown that up to 15% of these events happened uh, after the patient had just been seen by the nurse in, in like 20, 30 minutes ago. Um, all these things necessitate the need for continuous monitoring. Um, as far as capnography is concerned, um, that basically is important in monitoring patients' ventilation. Ventilation has been a missed aspect in the sense that it's mostly been uh, a clinical observation sort of a parameter uh, or limited to measurement of respiratory rate. Um, and um, there, there has to be a better need to monitor and measure ventilation, which has not been the standard up until this point. The, the rule of continuous uh, monitoring like uh, capnography and oximetry is that uh, it frees the individual, um, the, the, the caring individual, in this case particularly the nurses, from having to be um, vigilant all the time to look for clinical signs. They are early detector um, of, of uh, respiratory compromise and they allow uh, timely uh, intervention to take place before the patient gets into further trouble. If you were to ask me and I had a loved one in the hospital and you said what threshold should you define for respiratory depression in terms of an alarm on the monitor, I would want you to define a threshold where you were able to pick up a lot of events even if it meant picking up a lot of false alarms because I do not want my mom or dad to go unnoticed when they have a real event. So that's how I, I take this. If there's a lot of false positives, let there be more false positives. We don't want to have a single patient die unnoticed on the floor. I work as a critical care intensivist in a um, large volume surgical ICU. And um, I, I, I call this the two o'clock phenomenon as a 2 a.m. phenomenon. It happens again and again and again that you know between the hours of two to five in the morning, we get a call saying a patient has suddenly deteriorated on the regular floor. And our rapid response team responds to that call. They go to the bedside. Patient's either desaturating or has tachycardia for some reason, is tachypnic. And, you know, it's typically a post-surgical patient, post patient about three days in, after surgery. Um, they, they send him or her down to the ICU. And in the ICU, what that means for us is that a resident is at the bedside, a fellow's at the bedside, a, a ICU bed is utilized, 
Um, we, we mobilize all our resources. We, we do some very simple interventions and within a couple of hours, the patient is as good as before. Because we were monitoring in snapshots of time, we weren't able to proactively intervene because we did not see that pattern of deterioration. Had we proactively intervened on the floor, that rapid response call would have never happened. That patient would have probably stayed a day less in the hospital. That family would not have gone through all of that uncertainty of their loved one, who's usually an older gentleman, 70, 75 years old, and family is also called to the bedside. Patient coming back to the ICU, going, to, going through that emotional trauma. We wouldn't have burnt all our resources, putting an ICU bed up for a relatively simple problem. So all put together, simple upstream interventions proactively done will save patients from coming to the ICU in the middle of the night.